The UCLA Anderson forecast is well into its sixth decade of doing this kind of work. Um, talk a little bit about the the process. Um, the other economists, where does it begin with a national forecast that then drills down to the local forecast? How much of it is uh, modeling? How much of it is intuition? How much of it is conversation and disagreement between y'all? Give us kind of a picture of, of, of how you arrive at, at the forecast. It starts with what is probably the least interesting for 90 percent of the uh, of the world out there, which is with the statistical model. Again, we pull together all the data we have on the national economy, what's going on in California, and even what's going on specifically locally in some of the the, uh, the, the metro areas in California. Pull all that together, and we have a statistical model that the the primary function of that is. If the future is like the past, the statistical model gives you a pretty good sense for what to expect. Uh, there are two issues where, where I guess what I would call the art of forecasting comes in. Uh, number one, the statistical models are really bad at turning points. Um, sort of assumes that you know, GDP growth is a, uh, is a random variable that usually is about 3% plus or minus 2%. You know, that's a pretty good forecast of GDP if you don't have any other background at all. Uh, the trick is that sometimes you have recession episodes that change, uh, that change uh, the statistical properties of what to expect from GDP. And it's the transition. I think the, the, the biggest thing the forecast has to decide on a daily basis is when these transition periods occur. And we definitely have some statistical background for that. But again, that's uh, the, the statistical theory of how to do that is still in its infancy, I think, the, these regime changes, et cetera. So a large part of what we have to do is, uh, you know, we talk about the forecast, we talk about both the models and, and the minds. And so a lot of what we do is taking what comes out of the model and then you know, just sort of thinking about using the fact that we have economists who have, you know, seen seen these cycles come and go over and over and over again, and sort of bringing your intuition, and uh, you know, again, I guess just sort of your economic insight into what the model's saying. We, we at the moment have four economists uh, on staff. Is there, is there actually a, a, a moment each quarter when you're all locked in a room with sheaves of paper and, and empty pizza boxes and you are debating what, what the forecast is going to be? Or, or at, at what point do you have to say, all right, this is what we're going to go with. Let's let it go. What's that collaborative uh, moment like? Well, that's again. So, you know, I said the first thing is the statistical model. So about uh, three to four weeks before we actually release the forecast is the first run of the national model. We start with the national model and work down. You know, there's never been an instant instance where California is doing really well and the rest of the nation is doing terribly. So the national forecast really sets uh, the background for all of our local forecasts. So that's what we start with first. Like I said, about a month ahead of time, uh, we get the first run of those, the, the national forecast and sit down and really go through it, all four of us, again, both the people who specialize in the national economy and uh, Jerry and I, who are specializing more in the California-specific stuff, and sit down and say, all right, what do you think of these numbers? Uh, I think their forecast of oil prices is, is not, uh, not in line with what we're thinking is going to happen. I think net exports are going to be stronger. I think the Fed might still have some room to cut interest rates in the end of the year. The, uh, uh, one, of, one of the things we've been arguing most about has been how the, how the Fed would respond to this sluggish but not recession economy that I've been describing. Uh, and we, you know, we... we we try as hard as we can to get to a consensus. Uh, I think a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of times there's there's the devil's advocate approach too. That's that's actually what I end up doing a lot. That, you know, I agree with everything we're saying, but let me just throw this out there because somebody's going to ask us about this sooner or later. And yeah, you know, no brass knuckles or anything like that in that meeting. But they can get, uh, you know, they can get fairly heated. But what emerges from that is something that, you know, a basic story that is told through the numbers in this forecast and also the ideas for what the, you know, what, what's, the, what's the economic story right now? I think that's the thing 
uh, that we've really been concentrating on, uh, I would say, for the past six, seven years, the forecast has been, you know, the, the numbers are important, but really what we're about now is analysis and insight of the story of the economy. What, why is it the way it is right now? So tell me a little bit, bit about your education as a forecaster. Tell, briefly tell me about your, your, you know, your graduate work, how you became an economist with that, that doctor in front of your, your name, but also when you become a UCI Anderson forecaster, is there another education you have to undergo to because uh, uh, it's not the typical work mm -hmm. that, that everyone with a, with a PhD uh, goes and does? Uh, well, my graduate work at Berkeley, uh, I, my two fields were macroeconomics and international economics with a healthy dose of uh, finance and statistics as well. So my dissertation had a lot of, it had a big forecasting element to it, which was I was trying to bring, uh, you know, you can get a lot of insight from how, uh, how certain financial instruments are trading into what expectations of the future are. Um, so that's, you know, like I said, that's, that's been my academic interest for a long time. So I say there's a definite forecasting component to that. Uh, that said, you know, coming out of Berkeley, it was a very uh, no-nonsense, nuts and bolts, here's the statistics, here's how you do this kind of thing. Uh, you know, so very much the method of the, uh, the science end of the forecasting. Once I get here to the Anderson forecast and actually have to, uh, you know, to, to put it into practice, was where you get that secondary on the job education about the art of forecasting that you know these models historically again aren't very good at predicting turning points you need to bring something else to the uh, to the table there you know that decision again going back to all of the statistics always implicitly assumes the future is going to be like the past and the future is never exactly like the past so figuring out what's different this time and what's the same uh, this time is really something that, uh, uh, yeah, like you say, sort of the uh, y you only learn that by doing the for by actually sitting down and coming up with a forecast, and that's uh, something that, uh, like I say, is, is is something I've really picked up since I've since I've come here. Let's talk a little bit about outside factors. Mm -hmm. how, how big? A, how much do you have to read the international, you know, economic world to see what's going on in Europe or mm -hmm. Asia, or Latin America? And how much do you have to look at politics? Uh, does it matter who's running the Fed and who's sitting in the White House or who has the control of the legislature, that, those sorts of things? Well, I think the, the international influences on the national economy are something that we, we talk about regularly. Uh, you know, normally the, uh, the basic GDP accounting breaks, breaks economic output into consumption, investment, uh, government spending and then imports minus, I'm sorry, exports minus imports. Uh, one of the things, one of the big variables that we think is going to offset some of the housing weakness at the national level, uh, the dollar's been very weak uh, lately and we, we're forecasting that that's going to continue, uh, which will tend to make other countries find our goods cheaper and we find their goods more expensive. Uh, obviously, there's, there's both a good side and a bad side to that, but strictly from the GDP accounting, that means more export, we're more exporting more to other countries and we're importing fewer of their goods, which in a GDP context is a good thing. Um, so that's a, a moderation of the, of the trade deficit that, that we've had for so long now, and that's going to be an uh, offset to some of the real estate weakness. Um, the politics side, I think it does very much crucially depend on who's running the Fed. That's been one of the, uh, one of the things we've had to uh, deal with lately, though I don't really put that in the realm of politics. Um, there's a, uh, I think government policy does have a small but important role to, to play in the direction of the economy, but at the same time, I think uh, a lot of the politics, both at the national and the state level, is just the economy happens to be doing good. It had nothing to do with us, but we're going to take credit for it. If the economy is doing bad, it probably had little or nothing to do with us as well, but we're going to blame it on the guy who came before because, of course, he, he was the one who set up all of the, uh, the, the, the bad things that happen to us now. There's a, uh, a great discussion I remember seeing a while back of, uh, in the 90s between a, uh, an economist who was a, sort of a Clinton partisan and an economist who was a Reagan partisan, and both of them were taking credit for the tech boom. Right. Um, you know, and 
there was perhaps a small grain of truth in both, uh, in both camps, but uh, at the same time, the tech boom was the tech boom largely because of what was going on outside of government. So again, I mean, we do keep an eye on politics, but it's really not a, uh, it's really not a big factor in our forecast. No one in forecasting is always right, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, how, do you, how difficult is it, I guess emotionally, to after things haven't gone exactly the way we've thought, to get back up and say, it didn't work out the way we thought, but here's why we're right about the future this <laughs> well, time. There's an old joke about economists that our profession really specializes in telling you why we were wrong the last time around. Um, but again, I think this goes back to this decision of, you know, as a forecaster, you're constantly trying to figure out how it's different this time around and what the implications of that are. Uh, if you're in one of these situations where it's just the same as it was the last time around, uh, that forecast is, is a little bit easier to make. But again, like I say, it never is. So there's always the debrief period, the, well, it didn't quite go down the way I expected, and now I need to figure out why. But that's what makes you, that's, that's sort of how you get this, uh, this on-the-job education of a forecaster. Again, the, well, all right, that, you know, that forecast wasn't quite right, but it was because I downplayed this factor too much. Okay, next time around. You know, I, I think part of the issue with that, though, is that maybe forecasters like generals fight the last war. You know, again, so you're trying to, we're really concentrating on learning the lessons of the last time around and applying them to what's going on now. And that's always, you know, like I say, that's a real moving target. And I think that's one of the real challenges of, uh, of actually putting your, uh, putting your flag in the ground and saying, you know, I don't think there's going to be a recession in the next 12 months. All right, let's do a little uh, forecasting for, uh, for dummies. Okay. What, um, if I were to promise to read the, the business section of the local paper uh, every day, what um, one or two or three things should I pay closest attention to if I'm trying to make my own uh, assessment of how the economy is going to go in California? The California economy. Uh, really the best data that we have on a, on a fairly frequent basis in California's employment numbers. And usually the papers want them, once a month will be covering the, the most recent uh, uh, employment release from the Employment Development Department. Uh, the trick is, I think, is that sometimes you can get so focused on, you know, this month this number went up 2% compared to 12 months ago, or, you know, really, uh, read way too much into one blip of the data because these things do have just a random component of noise in them month to month to month. And so really I think the thing that is tough when you're sort of following the news coverage of this that tends to focus on, you know, GDP growth was this percentage, you know, this rate this year, you know, you need a little bit broader context for that. You need to see the trend, what's been going on over the past six months or so. Um, and you know, a lot of times these news, these news stories will cover the number and then get several people who wear my kind of hat as a forecaster or just pontificator of the, uh, of things economic will, uh, you know, be asked to comment on what this number means and the, and, and the trends and such. Um, but I think uh, the, the interest rate environment at a national level is one of the things that is most determinable what's going to happen. You know, again, I mentioned before this, this inverted yield curve that we've seen for uh, uh, up until very recently where short-term interest rates were higher than long-term interest rates. That's never a good sign for the economy. It's a pretty good, uh, pretty good predictor of recession since World War II. Um, again, the housing market tends to be another one of the things we watch as one of the first places that, uh, that you see economic weakness, that's been pretty, uh, uh, pretty standard over the 10 recession events that we look at. 